Welcome to the American Railroading Podcast, brought to you by the Revolution Rail Group, live from the great state of Texas. Join us as we educate, entertain, and explore the world of American railroading. Here's your host, industry veteran, Don Walsh. Well, hey, welcome everybody to the American Railroading Podcast. I am indeed your host, Don Walsh, President and CEO of the Revolution Rail Group, the anchor sponsor for the American Railroading Podcast. And I want to start out today by saying thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you that listened, that watched, that downloaded and subscribed to episode one. Folks, I can't thank you enough. Due to all of your love and showing love for our episode, we have skyrocketed to just within the top 10% of podcasts in the first week of that episode release, which is absolutely incredible. So thank you so much. We're glad to have you aboard, and we're going to continue to provide you with quality content that you're going to enjoy episode after episode. And we're going to do that starting today. We have some information we want to share with you about railroad, rail car maintenance and technology. Now, there's no way we're going to get through all of that today. Obviously, it's going to take multiple episodes, probably a couple of years of episodes to get through all of that. But we're just going to touch on some of it today to share a little bit with you um, and we'll hopefully enlighten you in some things. We're going to focus on one particular type of inspection uh, in just a few minutes. So rail car maintenance providers are considered a part of the railway supply segment of the industry. So last week, a group uh, called Oxford Economics uh, hosted a webinar sponsored by the Railway Supply Institute on April 5th, where they said railway supply industry supports 240,000 direct jobs. And for every one job of those 240,000 jobs, they create another 1.9 jobs in other industries, which is absolutely amazing. So I wanted to share that because, folks, there's a lot of people out there working really hard to make sure that the rail cars and their components are safe, that they are compliant and they are functioning as designed. And speaking of the rail cars themselves, there are approximately 1.6 million rail cars in the United States, most of which are in utilization. I say that because they, they, they could be in storage somewhere, right? And typically there's about 80% cars in utilization. The remainder are in storage. But recently I can tell you as a rail car broker who's helping people to find rail cars for sale or lease, there's not that many out there available right now. So the majority of rail cars are in utilization and they could need maintenance at any time. Now it doesn't have to be anything severe. It could simply be a, a $2 decal. Of course, it's more than $2, but it could be a decal on the side of the car that got obliterated by a tree branch in transit. And those things have to be legible at all times. So they could be sent in for that. Uh, It could be a brake shoe, which it doesn't mean that the brake shoe is broken or missing. It's just condemnable. So we're regularly, we're very highly regulated on what is allowable. So if the brake shoe isn't thick enough, that could be simply enough to say, hey, we got to pull that car aside and have it repaired by a certified repair facility. So we have what we call call bad orders. So a bad order is when something is found in the car and has to be home shop for repair. We also have rail car owners and fleet managers who do periodic maintenance. So it's scheduled maintenance, which is great. We want them to do that, right? So it could be based on mileage. It could be based on how many loads they've had. There's different ways of doing that. And then we have regulatory compliance where things have to be brought into shop to be looked at periodically to make sure that they're still suitable for interchange. So that a perfect example of that would be tank cars. So we have what's called HM216B, which is a regulation, a regulatory compliance inspection. For tank cars, they have to be brought in for general purpose, like for a corn syrup car every 10 years to be reviewed. And for a pressure car, like an LPG car, every five years to be reviewed. So regardless of why a rail car is being brought in, whether it's a bad order, whether it's periodic inspection for uh, the car owner maintenance they've scheduled, or whether it's regulatory compliance, it takes an individual to go out there and inspect these rail cars. And they have to be extremely knowledgeable of the regulations to do that. So you've got information that they have to review, like the Association of American Railroads has a field manual. Okay? And that field manual, not to be blasphemous, but is essentially the Bible that we look at, right? So it's literally 700 plus pages of information, and it's extremely detailed. So you have information about every single task that you could do. There's a job code for every single task that you could do. There's why made codes, qualifiers, car condition codes, all in rule 83. And then it all has to be done in a certain format It's called the billing repair card, the BRC. So there's so much that that person has to understand. Then there's, there's books from the FRA you have to have on hand. There's books from the department of transportation, from FEMSA, from the Bureau of explosives. And then each and every car owner could have a specific, um, specific type of um, 
scope of work that they want you to follow for a car type that they own or a service that their cars happen to be in. So you have to be aware of all of those things. And I say all that because it's not as easy as it looks. And I am a living and perfect example of that. So I'm going to poke a little fun at myself here, if that's all right with everybody. Um, I'm not above that. I make mistakes. And I walked into this industry. We talked about it in the first episode where I was a teenager and I went into repair, a repair shop in Chicago doing summer work. And, um, but that wasn't really rail car repair. I was cleaning up. I was helping up around the shop and that. But when I was in my mid twenties, which was just a couple of years ago, of course, I was offered an opportunity to do a management candidate, um, training group. And I was one of three people that was brought into this group. And I said, absolutely sign me up. And for any company that doesn't do management candidate training, I, I really encourage you to do so, to find a way to create a program like that. It is a, it is a great program for, to bring people up through the ranks that come up from the ground floor to teach them how to not only be a leader in the industry, but each aspect of the rail car repair industry um, is related to the shops or whatever business you're in. And it's a, it's a good uh, level way to level the playing field for folks that don't have a college degree. And even for those that do have a college degree, it allows them exposure to the industry but without just subjecting them to it and throwing them into it. So I'll get off my soapbox there, but I think that management candidate programs are amazing. So the first uh, opportunity for me in the management candidate program was at a facility 18 hours away from home. Never been out there before, never met the folks before. So I drove 18 hours. I get out there, I get my hotel room. And the next morning we started before dawn and I went and I introduced myself. So I, I get in and it's, it's dark. It, the sun hadn't come up yet. And the assistant plant manager introduces himself to me and kind of looks me up and down like, who is this kid? <laughs> Cause I looked like I was 12, you know, I looked like a child and I thought I knew everything. I thought I had it all figured out as I'm sure we all did in our twenties. And he said, we're going to start you out with rail car inspection. I said, okay, great. So he walks me to the inspector's uh, offices. Now, for those of you in the industry or in any related industry, you understand that we repurpose things. So when it comes to offices, we don't necessarily go out and buy some new Connex trailer. We repurpose boxcars and things like that, whether it's for parts storage or whether it's for uh, an office, in this case, for inspection. So if you can picture this, the sun hasn't come up yet. I'm barely awake. I don't know any of these folks. They don't know me. I'm getting walked out to this box car <laughs> that looks like it's been around for a hundred years. They open the doors and it's full of wood paneling. Like you'd see in your grandma's basement in 1980, something there's, there is a light, but it's barely on. There's a, a desk in front of me. That's empty. Um, which I'm assuming is for me. There are bookshelves full of books all around, um, which I spoke about a minute ago. I mean, you literally have to have a library to do this job. And to the left is a desk with a gentleman sitting in it that looks like he just walked out of the woods somewhere. Huge man, big old beard and mustache, scared me to death. And if you're listening, Mike, I love you. You know, I do, but you scared me. <laughs> and, and he just looks at me shaking his head like, what are we going to do with this kid? You know, I said, hey, I'm here to help. Right. I'm, I'm here to help. I'm here to learn. So he stands up and he hands me a notepad, a blank notepad and a pencil and says, here, follow me. He opens up the door to the box car and outside the door was a hopper car because we had an inbound track that ran uh, adjacent to the inspection uh, trailer. He said, I want you to go inspect that hopper car. I said, okay, how hard can that be? I mean, you know, I'm mechanically inclined. I've worked around construction and that with my family as a kid. I've, I've changed engines and transmissions out with my dad. Uh, you know, as a young kid, of course, that means holding the flashlight. And those of you who've done it for your dad, you know what I'm saying. So I go and I, I walk around this hopper car and I'm telling you, I had it all figured out, right? I walked around, I probably spent 20 minutes, 30 minutes looking at this thing and I get done and I, I get back in the office and I hand him a blank sheet of paper and I say, it looks great. It's good to go. He shakes, shakes his head and he had two words he would typically say, not even words, but sounds that he would utter. One was, mm -hmm, and the other one was, mm -hmm. So he looks at me, shakes his head and says, mm, and walks out the door with the pad and paper. Doesn't say another word to me. I'm thinking, oh God, he's mad at me. Uh, he's, I don't know what he's going to do, but he's mad at me. So I sat in there. I started going through the field manual, making notes, trying to learn things. He comes back after about 45 minutes and he has four pages worth of condemnable items on there from the same hopper car. I just looked at that. I found nothing wrong with. He found four pages and that's because 
he understood the rules and regulations. He understood the requirements of the customers. And I had no idea. I, I was, I, I learned that day. I knew nothing and I had a lot to learn. I had a long way to go. And thank God he was in my life because he taught me an awful lot as, as has everyone along my path. Um, so it's, it's not as easy as it looks folks. And the next question is then, you know, okay, so we have these folks in the field that are highly trained and there's a process when a car gets to a shop that ensures its quality when it goes out the door and then it's suitable for interchange. But what happens when the car is in interchange? What happens when it's in transit at 55 miles an hour across 140,000 miles of track in the United States? So that leads me to wanting to focus today on wheel bearings. The reason I want to focus on wheel bearings today is because the derailment that happened recently in East Palestine, Ohio on February 3rd was said to have been related to a wheel bearing failure. And it was ha it happened in transit, right? So how do we how do we understand and monitor the health and integrity of wheel bearings while they're while they're moving? With that said, I want to introduce our guest today who's going to talk to us about all that and more and in, including technology, where it's at today and where it's going to go and where it should go. Our guest today is Byron Porter. He's the founder and CCO of Hum Industrial Technology based out of St. Louis, Missouri, which was founded in 2019, has a focus on advanced wireless technology and predictive analytics in the railway supply chain. Byron lives in St. Louis currently with his wife, Emma, and their three boys. His background, he has a Bachelor of Science degree in chemical engineering from BYU and a Master's of Business Administration degree from Washington University, St. Louis, Olin Business School. His background also includes roles with ADM, which is Archer Daniels Midland. I always get that wrong, so I'm very proud of myself right now. <laughs> His roles were engineering superintendent, where he was a global subject matter expert for the company on rail car loading optimization and soy processing technology. He was also a plant engineer, production engineer, and Hum Industrial Technology recently, on March 16th, 2023, submitted a 17-page report to the Federal Railroad Administration, giving their perspective on the history, the benefits, and flaws of wayside detection currently used in North America. So who better to talk to right now, Byron? So welcome to the American Railroading Podcast. Thanks, Don. Appreciate that. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And thanks for joining us. So I've got to ask, what made you decide to get into the railroad industry in the first place, being a chemical engineer? Well, those degrees sound nice. I was never the academic type. I couldn't get out of school fast enough. So I, I kind of was chuckling. I actually didn't have those degrees. That my, my wife was more literate than I ever was. But I got into, uh, I got into the rail industry by accident, like I think a lot of people. Right at ADM, my time was, you know, I hired on as an engineer, a lot of processing engineering, done production engineering, just to try to make the plants run better. Well, there's a big part of that. And that's what comes in, how, how raw materials come in and how finished products leave the plant, right? And that happens on rail through a, a giant processor like, like ADM. 80% 80 of my time, though, was really focused in the plant. I got to know right, they they have a phenomenal. You talk about management training program. They didn't have a formal one at each camp. They had something to get just as good or better, where they put you out in the plant from day one and taught you how to operate it. And you were actually operating it on day shift, on night shift. That got me into the rail yard too, in the middle of the night, you know, those cold Illinois winters and trying to deal with frozen switches and the like. And so I kind of learned rail from from that side, but really from from the shippers end. And what you know, I, I work with phenomenal individuals. Talk about, you know, uh, this guy, Mike, uh, who mentored you in training. There are six guys at the plant who basically walked out of high school and walked into the plant when they were 18 years old. And they've been there for 40 some years, just you know, seen everything, done everything, could handle anything. And the one thing that always got me was the, the guy who was really kind of in charge of a lot of the rail operations. We have so many issues with, you know, Trains that didn't show up on time, didn't get empties, couldn't get uh, loads pulled, and it would just destroy kind of the rest of our production schedule, what we try to do. And he and everyone else would just, you know, rail's going to do what rail's going to do. And that always just stuck in the back of my mind. And then that, and, you know, we had, Aiden was a phenomenal company to work for, um, 30,000 employees. We had three fatalities one year. Two of those happened in the rail yard. 
And uh, as I after I left ADM and decided to go pursue my MBA and, and got caught up speed on what technology was there, those two things that the safety and efficiency aspect of, of rail could be done to improve it kind of merged with the technology and that was kind of the creation of Palm. So you know we, we set out back in 2019 technology, particularly wireless sensors to, to make rail smarter and safer. Um then been going at it ever since. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. And not everyone listening or watching has rail background. So if you could, could you paint a picture for us of what a wheel bearing is and how it functions? I know that people have wheel bearings in their cars. People have wheel bearings in their bicycles at home. Is it similar? Is it different? How do they, how do they operate in a rail car? Yeah. So, and it's, it's really the same principle, you know, rail car bearings are big, uh, especially compared to, to the environment I came from. Um, certainly much bigger than auto bearing, you know, it's six inches in the diameter, it's 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 large. Um, but a bearing, uh, a rail car bearing, like any other bearing, it's just a way of trying to transfer uh, a static or a dynamic load uh, to a rotating piece, right? And doing that in as frictionless way as possible, right? That's where your the, the engineering losses come in and you lose, uh, you lose efficiency in your in mechanical system that way. So they're highly, highly engineered pieces. You know, the tapered roller bearings used in, in rail car bearings have been around since the, the 50s. Um, uh, there's a lot of a lot of engineering work that, that goes into it, but it's all in an effort to just reduce as much friction and, and loss in the system as possible to allow for you know a nice, a nice smooth ride. Okay. And old school rail car wheel bearings that I saw some of when I first started were considering considered hot boxes where you would literally, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you would literally open up the hatch on the side of the wheel bearing and put lubrication in there. Um, but obviously things have come a long way since then. So how are today's wheel bearings different than the old school hot boxes? Yeah. Yeah. So the old school hot boxes, um, and you can still find these, uh, you see a lot of cabooses parked in random places. You know, I think I was in Eastern Tennessee one time. I saw some old caboose that was parked outside a restaurant or a cafe somewhere. And it had the old bogey system, it had the old truck systems, and it had, had these, these boxes, right? And that's literally what it was. So earlier bearings, you had a brass sleeve that that uh, rotated and had a little wick. And it's it's you know it's similar in, in conveyor parlance to, to an oil bath car where it, as the rotating piece comes around, uh, it, it keeps a lubricating uh, component. Rotating. So you have a box to house it all in, and uh, back in the day, and I think maybe Hunter Harrison even started off as as one of these guys when you'd have oil in, who would go as the, the cars in the yard and they just go and top off oil and all the box. Well, <clears throat> you can imagine this is a problem if, for whatever reason, that that box doesn't you know stay full of oil and you need to stand you have, or if you have a leak in the box somewhere and the oil spills out, then you got a metal on metal. Uh, uh, rotation and you know obviously high friction and if you've got you know residual oil in the box that's a great thing to, to light up and that's where you term a hot box uh, and you can see those on fire and, and, and the like right so transition that then to, to the tapered roller bearing where you have a completely enclosed uh bearing that's slipped onto to the end of an axle uh and everything is kind of internal it's packed with grease it's sealed and that's really kind of the modern bearing style that's you don't want to open it up when you have an open bearing like like the old hot boxes, dust, sand, dirt. I mean, uh, generally today in modern kind of reliability program, this is done in like a clean room environment, not quite like you know a, a semiconductor fab, but you, you try to minimize the particulate to get in there because that that all starts to create friction and rubbing, wearing down the surface, and premature premature failure. So everything's all self-contained uh, and uh, mounted onto the, onto the end. So it's a significant improvement from the old days for sure. Yeah. And so in a perfect world, how long would the average wheel bearing last or how should how long should it last? Yeah, so some heuristics, I guess, are uh, bearings left uh, probably are designed for one to 1.2 million miles. Okay. So you contrast that with, you know, for, for example, you contrast that with a rail car wheel. Uh, those are typically depends on a lot of factors, right? In eastern versus western curves versus versus uh, straight. 
uh, on, the, on the track, and, and those can last anywhere, say, 250 to 350,000 miles. And this is all, you know, statistical averages, right? I think maybe, maybe the L10 lack of the variance is up there to 1.2 million, million miles, so some can last far, far longer. Okay. And there's different ways that a wheel bearing can fail, I would assume. And could you walk us through the most common types of failure and give a brief description of those? Yeah, certainly, certainly different, different ways. I think, uh, you know, if, if, if there's water ingress, uh, maybe it's Hurricane Harvey, uh, the one that came through, uh, through Texas and you have flooding everywhere, right? If you get water into, into the rail car bearing, that starts to eat away and you start to develop a failure type called water edge bearing. Um, that's generally how that starts, but uh, more more common probably are, are the, the spalls uh, that, that happen. And that really is, you take a, a, a bearing and you know it looks maybe looks great, but obviously there's imperfection. It's not perfectly cast material uh, or with how with how the bearings made. So you might have subsurface cracks, uh, things that happen under underneath the surface. That over time, with enough you know loading and, and unloading of that bearing rotation that eventually causes that to, to stress and to break and so then you start to get what's called a small right you have a piece of the material of the surface of the bearing that basically flakes off uh not a big deal it's a, once it first happens that that piece of material then kind of gets uh you know uh, ground up or, or entrained and greased and life goes on right but now you've got a weak spot so instead of having a nice perfectly smooth surface you then have a rough spot, and every time it goes to that loaded zone, right, it's it's going to stress the bearing different, and then those subsurface cracks are going to grow, more spalling is going to occur, and so eventually you have, uh, you know, a, a large amount of damage around around the, the surface uh, of the bearing. You have a lot of that material that doesn't have any place to go, right? It's a solid closed system. That material then starts to, you know, I call it loose change. You get enough loose change rattling around in there. Then you do start to see kind of metal on metal interaction, uh, and, and that brings in the friction and the heat and causes the bearing to heat up. And that's where it's something like an East Palestine, you know, a, a, a burnt off journal or a wheel bearing failure. That 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 end of the axle now is, or the journal is now so hot that it's able to to then cause that to, to break. And that's unbelievable to me. We'll talk about that in a little bit here, how that exactly happened. But that's mind blowing that it can get that hot. Now, the and, average. And thing you we think about this too, right? This is this is a six inch diameter axle. This isn't like a little stick or anything. This is this is some sizable mass right there. But you also have 143 tons sitting on that, rotating, you know, up to you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. That's some considerable force and torque that's applied to that. Uh, so the magnitude of this, I don't want to, you know, it's one thing I talk about a little car, you know, wheel bearing or, or a uh, pillow block bearing on a conveyor and plant. Um, these are, the magnitude and size of this is, is usually quite a bit larger than what you generally find, especially if you're falling out there. As you said, 1.6 million rail cars. So this is a, this is kind of the mega size uh, uh, application for, for some of these bearings. Absolutely. And we talked about the speed that a train moves at. So they're averaging 55 miles an hour. So clearly you or I can't stand there and visually inspect these things, every single one of them as they roll by. So technology must play a part in monitoring and reporting the bearing health and integrity um, along the 140,000 miles of railroad. And I think it's 623 railroads that operate on them. One of the primary methods uh, used today are wayside detectors. And it's my understanding there's two basically different types standardized of wayside detectors. Can you take a moment and just talk about the two different types? Yeah, yeah. So uh, when a bearing, so like, you know, from your background being being a, a car inspector, right? There's, once you, you create that closed system on, on that bearing and you don't want to open it up because you don't want to introduce any particulate matter or anything that could degrade the bearing. Um, there's no way of telling what you got under the hood until you open it up, really, right? You can spin that thing, but it's a lot different spinning it by hand when it's unloaded versus spinning it when it's fully loaded 143 tons at you know, 60 miles an hour, five miles an hour, right? So there's no great way to, to really inspect it unless the bearing is completely shot. 
then maybe you'll start to start to hear something, but it really shouldn't be in service at that point if you can hear. And, and we've heard of, you know, there's there's people try their best to figure it out. One one short line I know they had a, a hot bearing development and they spent about thirty five thousand bucks to go through their entire fleet and roll every bearing by hand and they said we didn't learn a darn thing. So visual inspection, uh, there's a lot of things you can do with the on a car to, to really identify defects. You cannot do that with bearings. Uh, so putting putting that out there for what it's worth. Now the two methods for trying to identify bearing failure in the industry for the past seven years uh, have been through temperature and through acoustic or vibration. Temperature going back to the 40s, hot box detectors, the idea of using infrared uh, to, to scan thermally the surface of the bearing, and then between that and comparing it to, to various methods, to, to ambient or to the other bearing on the axle, trying to determine if you have an outlier, if you have something that's heating up. And, and East Palestine, the realm is a perfect example of that. That's three hot box detectors that the temperature was climbing from that. The system performed as it should have uh, in, in that respect. But you're really only telling what the temperature is. Um, temperature is a, a late stage indicator of a bearing failure, right? So you go back to what we talked about when you first start to have those spools and you start to get more material and grease and train in the grease. Until you have friction uh, from, from all that interaction, you really start to increase the heat inside the bearing. You can't detect that damage. So the damage has to progress enough for where a, a temperature uh, indication to, to really kind of make itself known. Um, so it's kind of a last ditch effort and it's been very effective, right? You know, going back to the 1980s and deregulation and as more and more hot box detectors got put out in the national network. Now we have more than 6,000 of them. Um, they're good at spotting 99.5% of uh, bearing values, right? Um, so they've, they've, they've certainly been effective at doing that and taking out a lot of the worst cases and really helping manufacturers even improve some defects that were creating a lot of those earlier uh, elements and, and failures. Now, contrast that with an acoustic bearing detector. An acoustic bearing detector, commonly known as a, a, or sold under the name of the TADS or a rail BAM, a couple brand names. You have a microphone array that's set right next to the rail track. And as the, the train passes by, those microphones pick up on the sounds that, that the train emits. Uh, and then through a, a number of algorithms and a whole lot of signal processing to, to filter out all the noise, uh, they then are able to identify the magnitude, the frequency of, of particular components like the cup, the cone, the rollers, and the bearing, and assign you know, the conditions of severity to, uh, severity to those. Those have really only been around since the, the late 90s, and there's about 39 of those out in, um, out in service in North America, the others uh, around the world. So those are the two basic types, two basic flavors. Uh, the acoustic bearing detector obviously gets closer to identifying damage before it occurs or before it becomes catastrophic because it's able to, to pick up earlier and earlier signs of, of uh, the damage based on, on the vibration. Okay. And of those two, it sounds like from the research that you've done and some research I did as well, that the hot box detectors are the most common type. Would that be correct? Correct. And you've already talked about how they functioned. So do they monitor only the wheel bearings or do the wayside detectors monitor other things as well? Yeah, they're primarily just for just for bearings. Uh, I, I could be wrong. We've spoken with people who use and make acoustic bearing detectors. Uh, generally, they have to to uh, they, they may have some additional uh, components at the installation site, like a wild detector, wheel impact load detector. But uh, acoustically, I don't think anyone's really monitoring anything but bearings. Okay, so when an alert is sounded, how is that alert? Um, sent out, and what is the threshold that creates that alert to be sent with a hot box detector? Yeah, so typical, um, and it's it, as as it's been made known or, or kind of well hashed out in the press, right? Uh, it's different railroad to the railroad. Typically, it's, uh, an alert is sounded when it's 170 degrees above ambient for hot box detector, or I believe it's it's a 95 degree differential between ends of the axle. Uh, bearings on, on, on the same axle. 
uh, that's going to cause an alert to, to then be sent to the locomotive cab. Okay. Can are there be other factors that affect the the detection? So can weather be a factor? Can um, a false alert be sent be, as a result of weather, whether it's too hot? I mean, it gets awfully hot here in Texas. So could that impact um, the temperature and send a false alert? Yeah, so there's a number of ways that false alerts can be created, both for hot box detectors and acoustic frame detectors. Something even as uh, simple as sunlight uh, on on uh, a hot box detector uh, can cause it to, to give off false alarm. Uh, hot box detectors also need to be calibrated, um, so they have to be inspected. Some of them are inspected monthly, some of them are, are inspected more on, on a condition based uh, basis when they start to see the temperature walking. Uh, but they do require some kind of continual maintenance to, to make sure that they're working properly. I think that newer hot box detectors, some what they call multi scan, where they use uh, eight different uh, readings or, or uh, scan the bearing in eight, eight different places. I, I don't know exactly how, how they've done it, but uh, some of the manufacturers told me that they've been able to. Uh, Work out those those false positives, like like for sunlight, and be able to, be able to uh, eliminate those. Um, and I, I don't know what the cut is between kind of the newer uh, multi scan hot box detectors and, and the older style. I'm assuming it's probably very few multi scan, at least from the sounds of it uh, in the industry, um, uh, uh, for the hot box detectors. Now, acoustic grain detectors, um, they're also they can be. Uh, I don't want to call them finicky. You know, it's not. It's not uh, our bread and butter to, to get into words uh, to get into the details on acoustic grain detectors, but there are several things that can cause them to uh, falsely identify, you know, a bearing um, as being problematic. At least not uh, those microphones, right? They're as close as they can be to the, to those bearings, but uh, they're not right on top of them, right? So there's a distance factor, there's ambient noise that that comes into play uh, if you have a, a high impact wheel go through there uh, this is why they include wild detectors at a lot of sites so they can parse out when there's an actual high impact load that's messing with the, uh, their algorithm their signal processing that can affect it uh brakes that are applied you know if you have a, a one and a half mile long train going through uh an acoustic bearing detector site and they hit the brakes just once you know that can throw off a whole bunch of readings uh, uh the locomotive engine can throw it off and that's why acoustic grade detector manufacturers spend a lot of time and doing some pretty heavy signal processing to try and parse all those things out. But it, it does um, impede their ability to, to really kind of push the envelope in, in, in terms of how much visibility they can gain into the condition of that bearing. So, yes, uh, and, and traditionally, this is what they've had uh, very, very loud bearings, very easy for the acoustic bearing detector to pick up uh, without issue. Now, some, some important statistics fell from the industry, too. Uh, this kind of plays out in, in when bearings are removed, they have to be uh, um, torn down and analyzed uh, if they've been, been flagged. So that's an MD-11 report. Uh, consistently for decades now, uh, data has indicated that anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of bearings that are removed are considered non-verified. That's the MD-11 name for it meaning that there's no damage found on that bearing. So you got about a you know 60 to 70 percent hit, hit rate on hot box detectors uh, in terms of their efficacy and identifying bad bearings. And then of course there's the you know I mentioned 99.5 percent are detected before failure. And then you have obviously the 0.5 percent that go undetected that cause the realness like like these ballast Um on acoustic bearing detectors, um, you know, their their efficacy they have, in order to be put in and commissioned uh, as a site, they have to reach at least a 90% accuracy level on, on 50 bearings. So they got to get 40 out of 50 right in order to be considered commissioned and, and, and usable. Now, some data that we've seen uh, uh, presentations and conferences uh, have indicated that sometimes that, that false positive rate can, can creep up from maybe a 10% when it started all the way up to 97%. Um, so there is some variation, and, and we've talked with manufacturers and tried to dig into, you know, where does this happen? Is this a maintenance issue? Is this, uh, you know, something, is that just an outlier? Is there only one that's ever been out there that's, that had 97% false positive rate? Um, any number of, uh, of reasons, we haven't been able to figure out why, but it's, the, the data is there. They, they, they are not foolproof. They're not infallible. 
Um, and you, you see that too coming out when you have customers that we've seen, they have a, a wheel set that gets flagged for an acoustic bearing detector uh, as, as uh, a bearing that needs to be replaced. And it's only gone 10,000 miles since the last wheel set replacement, right? Uh, you have to wonder on some of those what, why that is. So that's a, that's a lot of information. I'll pause there. Uh, hopefully uh, that answers some of those questions. So. No, that's all good stuff. And I appreciate it. Absolutely. And I know our listeners and viewers are going to appreciate that as well. So when an alert is sounded, who is it communicated to? And what are the next steps after they receive an alert? Yeah, so typically alerts communicated then to the locomotive engineer. Um, the locomotive engineer then uh, start to slow down the train or, or stop the train. Now, generally, um, the information is also communicated to a central desk at most, most railroads. Uh, they have, you know, a mechanical desk that monitors all these, that does all the trending, that, that you know, puts all the information together on both hot box and, and uh uh, acoustic brain detectors and every other type of defect detector they have, and they'll work with the dispatcher to decide, you know, what what the issue is, and if that car needs to be set out or needs to be limped into the yard at reduced speed, or or whatever. Now, also, and when they, um, and I don't know if this happens every time. I believe it happens most every time, and certainly this was the practice previously that uh, um, the guy in the cab is going to get out and he's going to walk back through that problematic bearing. And he's actually going to hit a number of bearings in that area using something called a temple stick. And, and you might be familiar with this from, from your car inspection days, right? A temple stick is really just a piece of wax that will melt at a specific temperature. So when it's put on bearing, uh, that bearing is hot enough, it's going to melt that, indicating that's, that's a bad bearing. And that's what's been done for, for a number of years in, in identifying bad bearings. Okay. And then once it's identified... I'm assuming the car is removed from service at that point. So how is that done? And then is there an inspection, more thorough inspection done at that point? Yeah, like I said, so it's going to be, that train is going to be limped into a yard or it's going to, you know, obviously be at a reduced speed. Now, the, the bearing remains hot for at least an hour after it, after it heats up. Um, and it's going to, uh, it, and it's much less of an issue at a lower speed than a higher speed. Of course. Load and speed are the two things that increase bearing, bearing wear and bearing fatigue. Uh, so they're going to try and kind of link that into the closest place where they can set the car out. And, and once that's set out, then they're able to, to pull the wheel set. That bearing comes off. And like I said, it's got to go through a, a full teardown analysis. MD11 report has to be created for it. And uh, the root cause of that failure identified. Okay. And then we'll go back now to the derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. Um, you've done a very good job of explaining um how it potentially went wrong. We don't know yet. I don't think the report's actually out yet, but if you can just one more time, walk us through that, how we presume it failed. And then you mentioned that it actually separated the wheel, I believe uh, is what you said. And correct me if I'm wrong, but if you can just walk us through that, because I, my mind was blown when, when you said that. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a burnt off journal derailment. Um, so yes, the, uh, well, I, I guess I'll get to that point, right? So you have, uh, hot box detectors as the train's progressing, it hits one, it tells it the, the temperature is, you know, at, at this amount and it hits the second one, 10 miles later, the temperature is climbing, but it's not yet enough to, to trigger the temperature threshold that would cause the train to, to derail. At that point in time, after it leaves that detector, the next detector is not for 20 miles. And so by the time it hits that third one, it's well exceeded the temperature threshold and it's on fire at that point. And only at that time is the hot box system then send the appropriate alert as it's been you know, programmed to do. The engineer starts to slow down the train and to stop the train. And, in the, and as he's doing that, the train derailed. Um, the, the, the burnt off journal, like I said, you know, have the bearing that heats up enough and all that, that uh, cork on the, on the uh, axle then causes the, the axle to, to break the journal. Um, <clears throat> a rail car sits on two trucks, bogeys outside the, of North America, but they're trucks. Each truck has has two axles in it, and those trucks sit on four points then, and those, those are the bearings. So if one of those four points is gone, because now it's broken off, that then causes the truck to collapse on that one side. And obviously, uh, it then derails in any, any number of ways, and the load and the contents of that car can go spilling too. 
And if everything's moving, I don't know what the speed exactly was, 40, 50 miles an hour at, at that point for, for the train, right? That's going to cause a number of subsequent events in the train and, and the pileup uh, of, of rail cars. Wow. You know, even having been in this industry for that long, as long as I have been, that that's still um, shocking to me that that can be that catastrophic from a wheel bearing overheating. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, the Association of American Railroads President and CEO Ian Jeffries wrote in a recent article published in The Hill as an opinion contributor on April 8th titled, Rail Safety Requires Clear-Eyed Discourse and Real Solutions. Uh, Mr. Jeffries said some very positive data about the overall safety of our industry, but then also continued on to say that despite these truths, we must take further steps, including through voluntary actions and technologies. For instance, railroads are installing approximately 1,000 additional wayside hotbox, hotbox detectors on the national network, the systems meant to mitigate against incidents such as the East Palestine, Ohio derailment. These 6,000 detectors, which you mentioned earlier, that exist today because of the industry's inherent incentive for safety and not because it was told to do so. Nonetheless, all large railroads are also lowering alert thresholds to be more cautious. And, you know, that's all good news, right? So how far apart are the average hot box detectors today? Um, and maybe how far apart do you think they should be? Yeah, I think industry-wide, I think the FRA has said that the hot box detector spacing is at 25 miles. Now, each road is different. And I think the NS at least has come out and said, um, our, our hot box detector is spaced at 13.9 miles, at least on our our core network, whatever whatever that might be, right? Um, I think one of the most enlightening things that, that I found uh, is a study that was done with uh, TTCI and CP um, that uh, showed, you know, hypothetically, if we increase or, or decrease the space in pop box detectors, what's the optimal space? What should we really be, be going towards, right? Because some... Uh, some detectors, but you know, like like the one in, in Palestine, right? You have this this gap of 20 miles, and if there had been one in between, if you kept the 10 mile spacing, then maybe you would have caught it, and you should have caught it, and the alert was sound, and you'd be able to stop the train before that before that realm occurred. And so you've seen that work its way into to the uh, congressional bill to say let's mandate 10 mile spacing make that work. So this study that from 2017 looked at it uh, and determined you could go all the way from uh, to seven and a half miles and really make no significant, statistically significant improvement in derailment prevention. <clears throat> and they concluded the optimal spacing was 15 miles. So we should see if, if the industry average is 25 to 15 miles, our industry average is 25 and the additional hot box detectors move that down to 15 miles, you would think you'd see some statistically significant improvement in hot bearing derailments, and that should decrease. Or after that, it's largely not going to occur because you still, and you're not going to get to 100% even at whether it's 15 miles or seven and a half miles, because there's still derailments that occur even a mile or less after a detector for a, for a hot box detector. So temperature really is a very late stage indication. It's it's not perfect. It's done its it's done its job, but it's not going to get that hundred percent derailment prevention outcome that uh, we're all hoping and, and, and trying to work towards. Absolutely, which perfectly brings me to my next question. In the previous episode, we asked our guest this question. I'm going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> so it's the National Transportation Safety Board Chair Jennifer Hamandy. Uh, was recently quoted as saying, uh, referring to derailments, that, and I quote, we call these things accidents. There is no accident. Every single event that we investigate is preventable. So do you agree that 100% of accidents and incidents are preventable? You know, so many people, and I've kind of put myself in this camp too, really wish you would have said that, <clears throat> because now that's been taken and misconstrued as railroads are doing a horrible job. This is completely preventable. And then you get the, the very anti-capitalist crowd say, this is all about profits. And it's really kind of taking the conversation away from anything that, that's, you know, meaningful towards, towards improvement. Yes, there are things that can be done, right? <clears throat> and, and we're in the business of trying to help uh, to, to make those, those improvements. It's difficult to say this is 100% preventable uh, and, and any derailment 100% preventable. 
uh, but it's it's something that we can obviously continuously work in and improve at. Uh, onboard monitoring, and maybe we'll get to this in more uh, later on, but onboard monitoring really is a step change to help improve that uh, beyond just more detector spacing and, and having a saturated uh, detector network. That's the step change in a way that can, can create those meaningful uh, improvements and, and uh, reducing the risk of these hot bearings well. Absolutely. And getting toward new technologies here. Don't worry, we're getting there. Um, the association, I'm sorry, the, the um, chairman and president of the, of the Association of American Railroads, Ian Jeffries, again, continuing back to the article on the Hill from um, April 8th. He said, the overall safety of railroads is attributable to an all the, all the above approach at work each day, which includes technology like positive train control or PTC, as well as sensors that can make um, measure equipment safely, manual and techno technologically driven inspections and continued analysis and adaptation of protocols, particularly for hazardous material transport. Despite these truths, he continues to say, we must take further steps, including through voluntary actions and technologies. So here we are to new technology. So regarding new technology, some consider the HBD wayside detectors to be a reactive approach um, to ensuring wheel bearing integrity. What technology options are there in the industry currently that would be considered either uh, preventative and even seen as being predictive? Yeah, so the, the technology, and again, stepping back from just rail, uh, this is, you know, we deal with rotating equipment that has mass and moves at speed. That's no different than almost any other place in general industry. You know, I, I, I speak back to my experience of walking the plant floor and having to deal with pumped motors, fans, conveyors, all sorts of things that are rotated equipment that have bearings. Um, and the approach has been in those industries to use predictive tools and really, the, and for now for the last 30 plus years, uh, to use things like vibration monitoring and have someone go around and measure the vibration, you know, periodically at, uh, at, at on any bearings or on, on pump uh, and try to uh, get ahead of those, those premature indications of, of failure. And then once that's identified through those readings, whether continuous or periodic, um, you then can tell when that maintenance needs to occur before it occurs. You then schedule the maintenance, you have everything set up, so you reduce, uh, maybe you have a spare, you have a buddy pump, you have spares that you can take one down and, and perform maintenance on while you, you operate the other one, so that you, uh, your, your operation is not impacted the least bit, either from safety or, or from efficiency, right? So, uh, new technology like onboard monitoring, you're able to solve two, two of the key problems that uh, at least are stopping us from moving progressing further in things like hot bearing derailments in, in the rail industry. One is, is the, the, the data accuracy, right? Uh, as I said, decades, consistency uh, of 30% of the maintenance we're doing on bearings, bearings being pulled from service doesn't need to occur. You're 99.5% effective. That takes care of a lot, but it doesn't take care of everything. You still have bearings that burn off in, in less than a mile. So detectives cannot really solve that, that problem unless you go to, uh, you over maintain the equipment by some excessive amount or you do some excessive amount of train stops so that you have lower speeds to prevent anything from, from progressing to, to that point, right? So by, by putting uh, devices, uh, wireless sensors on the rail car, you're then able as close to the source as possible. You're just like that guy walking through the plant and monitoring those readings. You're able to get continuous or periodic uh, data that's, that's of very high quality. Um, now, now the second the second thing that uh, with this is <laughs> now being able to uh, schedule that maintenance so far ahead of time. Like I said, in, in, in a plant setting, you have the parts available on hand. Your, your downtime, if any, is, is minimized. Everybody's set up. It's done. When you do it that and you're prepared, it's done as safely as possible. If you've got guys out on, on the side of the track who are, who are swapping out wheel sets, right? That's that's less safe than if you have a prepared facility where everybody's set up and ready to go. Those two improvements, you know, predictive indication as well as that pre-planned maintenance, um, really kind of bring can bring the rail industry up to what the rest of the general industry has been doing for decades now. And then you're able to have the most efficient, safest operation possible. New technology, do you see 
um, or do you know, I should say, does the AAR require them to go through an approval process? I know for a lot of components and things, it's a two-year plan, maybe even longer than that, that the approval process that the tank car committee and others um, require. So is this something, this technology, would it also have to go through the same approval process? Yeah, uh, so it's, it's referred to by the AR as remote monitoring equipment or RME. Uh, I mean, remote monitoring equipment, at least in the form of GPS trackers, has been around for, for decades now. First, it started coming out in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, TIH, PIH cars, the more hazardous toxic cars were the first to, to really get it. And, and broadly speaking, that's about as far as, as it got. So it's not that we don't do any onboard monitoring of rail cars, but onboard condition monitoring of rail cars is, is very you know, the AR and recognizing this, as many sensor companies uh, have, have started coming out the last few years uh, with the, the decreased cost of the technology, making it a much more attractive and cost effective uh, option for, for rail car owners and railroads to equip the, the rail cars with. They've now finally updated the, the standard to go in F2045, which then governs all the things you need to do to be able to be approved and to have devices uh, running on rail cars. Well, believe it or not, Byron, we're nearing the end of our episode already. We've gone through a lot of great stuff, and thank you so much. I wanted to ask, are there any other thoughts you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap up for today? Yeah, I mean, one that I've, I've really kind of been beating drum since the deep house teams around it, you know, um, the way that we approach maintenance, and we've talked about it thoroughly here, the way we approach maintenance in, in the rail industry and derailment prevention, uh, it, was, it was a head scratcher for me when I came to the industry, to be honest. We allow these massive 143 ton pieces of metal moving at a fast clip, you know, like a, a car on a highway. We allow them to get to the point where a critical component like a bearing can fail. And then we rely on three things. One, that the weight side detection system is going to pick up on that bearing. Two, that that's going to be able to be communicated to the locomotive cab, the person who can act on it. And three, that that person who then acts on it it makes the, the, the appropriate decision, receives the communication, and can prevent that derailment. Just boggles my mind that, that we do it this way when, like I said, in the rest of general industry, all this is uh, planned and, and predicted ahead of time so that you avoid all, all these incidents. So, you know, we're, we're working at home towards a future where we use onboard monitoring, condition monitoring, wheels, the bearings, the trucks, other things. Be able to get that that make it scheduled at the right place, the right time, the lowest cost possible, and avoid you know uh, derailments, especially as well as train stops online, and allow trains to keep moving. moving. From from a, a, a high level standpoint, that's where the industry could go if they if they choose to, and that's the most effective way of, of really using this derailment as its wake up call in Palestine as a way of pushing the industry down to the next level in terms of both safety and efficiency. Great. Thank you so much. And where can folks reach you if they'd like to ask you some more questions? So uh, we're hominindustrial.com is our website. Uh, there's a form you can use to, to contact us there. You can reach out to me directly at Byron, B-Y-R-O-N, at hominindustrial.com. Always happy. I'm sure I'm going to tick off several people. I'm good at doing that with, with some of my analysis and the data that we have. Always happy to have uh, uh, a correction from, from people with a different viewpoint uh, as we seek just to, to move the industry along and, and provide the most, uh, most effective, most objective viewpoint out there. So we're at all the industry conferences to come talk to us. Love to, love to learn more about uh, how the world looks like from your side. Absolutely. And that's how we grow, right? It was by having conversations with one another and learning from one another. So there's nothing wrong with that. Byron, thank you again so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate the information you've shared with us on such a very important topic. So thank you. And would you be willing to join us again sometime on another episode? Absolutely. Thank you for you, Don. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Byron. And turning for just a minute to our veterans in the industry, I know that you're here in our introduction all the time, but we want to recognize you. And we do. I absolutely love our veterans. I love the folks that are currently enlisted and serving as well. We've got some pretty neat episodes coming up. I, I don't want to give away everything just yet. So you're going to have to tune in to see what's coming. But we are going to have some episodes coming up. Um, cater to you, our veterans. We love you. We want to, we want to focus on you. And I think you're really going to enjoy what we put out there. Um, 
Also, I want to just say a, a little bit about our anchor sponsor, the Revolution Rail Group. So it's a consulting and brokering firm in the rail car industry. So if anyone's out there that's needing assistance with your current rail car uh, repair, cleaning, transload facilities, or your merger and acquisition specialist, and you're looking for some guidance, feel free to reach out to us. And also in the brokering world, if you're looking to buy, sell, lease, or sublease rail cars, feel free to reach out to us as well at therevolutionrailgroup.com. And with that, folks, thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to having you with us on the next episode. God bless, make it a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us on the American Railroading Podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover on a future episode or want to support or sponsor the show, please visit our website at AmericanRailroading.net.